Hey everybody, welcome. This is Branching Factor. It's our new podcast. We're on episode number three. I can't believe we've actually made it this long. Somehow we're surviving. Amazingly so. And so, hello, I'm your host, Tommy Thompson. And today I'm here with another one of our fantastic four, another one of our wonderful set of co-hosts. Please give a warm welcome to Mike Cook. How hey, doing, sir. Hey, Tommy, how's it going? I'm doing great. I'm feeling good. I'm excited about this podcast. I'm excited to talk to you. I am excited to talk to you as well, because I realise, not just because for the benefit of our listeners who are like, hey, who are these wonderful people and, and really, who's this Mike? What's he all about? But also critically, because we haven't really caught up much in the last couple of months. Like, funnily enough, I think I had the same thing talking with our other uh, guests on the first couple, or co-host rather, for the first couple of episodes with uh, George and Quang was, um, we've had a whole bunch of conversations about starting this podcast. And then we haven't really talked about anything other than starting this podcast. <laughs> so, but yeah, so just for for the audience, I guess, just to fill you in a little bit. So what is The Branching Factor? So this is, is a podcast really about topics that are of interest to us, myself and the rest of my co-hosts. We are all involved in games in some way, shape or form, be it working in the games industry or working in games research and being a game scholar of some things. And particularly for myself, uh, you might know me as the voice of the AI and Games YouTube channel. And a big thing about what I try to do on that, that channel is all about demystifying things around game development and games research in a moderately intelligent way. And what we're doing on Branching Factor, it was just expanding that remit to cover more interesting topics, speaking with more interesting people. And on that note, that's why we have wonderful people like Mike joining me, because he's much smarter than I am. And he can speak much more eloquently about a lot of things Certainly I can, or at least, uh, you know, without a Scottish accent, which can actually help in some demographics. So I guess for the benefit of the audience, Mike, once you've recovered from that terrible joke, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? Ex all excellent questions. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, um, I'm an AI researcher in my day job. Um, I work at King's College London, um, and uh, I do research into game design, AI, procedural content generation, especially, and uh, computational creativity. Um, and in my spare time, I make games, I write about games, I think about games. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that, that, that takes up a, a huge chunk of my, of my daily brain power. Um, and it's really nice to have those two things interact with each other. And of course, that's, that's one of the ways that we met and one of the things that we talked about and worked about on um, lots over the years. Um, and uh, I guess I'm here to provide a bit of an academic perspective in some ways, um, and also maybe a bit of perspective on kind of making games as a researcher as well. There's a bit of that going on as well. Um, yeah, I think I think those are those are my key my key stats. <laughs> Your key stats. Um, I think <clears throat> critically as well. Like um, I've we've known each other now for actually about a decade, which is a little terrifying when you start thinking about it like that. <laughs> um, not as a reflection of yourself, but really just, oh my God, it's been 10 years. But I recall, you know, I think you're certainly one of the most public facing um, games researchers, particularly in the UK. Anyway, you're very uh, active on Twitter. You've done a lot of um, like public exhibition of your work in a way that a lot of other researchers maybe aren't comfortable doing or have no experience of. And, you know, particularly, I think for a lot of people, things like, um, you know, you were co-founder of, or you were the founder, I guess, of, of Proc Jam, um, so the procedural content generation jam, which still runs to this day. You've been involved in a lot of public events and kind of speaking to the, the, the broader community. You've even shown a lot of your research at games events to the general public, which uh, there's not many people I can think of that do that and or have the, the gusto maybe to do it because i think there's also there's a huge confidence element of that like are you going to be confident showing that stuff and hoping that the people get it but it's been really exciting watching that um like continue to develop even now with some of the work that you're you're doing just now um and i guess for full disclosure it's a little sh it's a bit funny because funnily enough we both worked at the same university for about three weeks or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, you're currently at King's College. I actually just left King's College um, in October, in September of last year. And uh, it was a shame because it was the one time we've actually worked in the same institution. And then it was like, oh, I've already got this plan to leave now. Bye. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah, they have a strict one in one out policy on games researchers at King's. Yeah, so. that was it. That was it. And I think, <laughs> I think they, they traded up 
quite frankly. Oh, no. It's safe to say. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, yeah, so, everyone knows you. It's funny. Uh, when, when your name comes up at King's, everyone instantly knows who you are and has nice things to say. It's really <laughs> sweet. So, I think also because, uh, you know, um, to actually to paint for the audience, like the situation, like one of the reasons I worked at King's was during the pandemic, my job was to help run an awful lot of our digital delivery. So training up staff, like funnily enough, like computer scientists aren't the best at computers. I think that's actually, you know, it might not seem obvious to you if you've not interacted with a lot of computer scientists, but it's kind of the truth. And so the idea that we're going to use a lot of recording tools like we're using for this podcast was something that a lot of people aren't necessarily comfortable with. And how do you then produce videos of your lectures? And, you know, can you, how do you adapt all that material to that? And even just doing, you know, we were doing effectively live streams for classes. Um, you know, you're kind of essentially doing a Twitch stream to like 300 people who are maybe, I don't know if they're more or less emotionally invested in the stream than before, because also their livelihood is kind of, is, is riding on it a little bit. So yeah, everybody got to know who I was pretty quickly because they're coming to me with technical questions mm-hmm. or, you know, hey, how, how, how do you set this up? Or, I was always really impressed by it because for every person who was like, I just want to make sure I do the bare minimum, but like really well, there was other people who they're like, oh, I'm trying to run this really complicated live stream setup with green screens and lighting and everything, but I'm, my computer's really struggling. And I'm like, what are you doing it on? It's like, oh, it's this MacBook from five years ago. I'm like, get a desktop, you maniac. Like, this is, this is why it's chugging. Like, you're trying to run all this through, like, the integrated graphics card in a MacBook. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, it, I think a lot of this stuff, so you mentioned public engagement, and I think the face of AI has changed a lot over the last decade. But um, when I began, AI was not, you know, in 2010, no one cared about AI, no one was interested in it. But I I wanted to be a journalist in the past. So I was always looking for stories, mm-hmm. you know, and I I knew that game AI was full of interesting stories. So I wanted to tell them and I, I wrote about my own work a lot because I wanted the public to be able to see what I was doing. But I also felt very lucky. So you said that you think it's like not a lot of researchers do it and it takes confidence. Um, and I, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I think I also felt really lucky that my research was something that people were interested in because it meant that you had like this opportunity to show it to people and they'd be you know, into it. Whereas it's it's harder in other fields, isn't it? Or, or even other areas of game AI, it's harder to kind of show people something. Um, but I think you and I were kind of both interested in finding new ways to communicate to people and contact people and connect with people. And so we we were kind of more up on all of this tech that otherwise as academics, you wouldn't have time to learn like live streaming and things like that. Um, you know, it's not something that the average lecturer who's, who's super overworked would even think to get into because you already, you know, you have no time already. Yeah. Um, but then COVID kind of got everyone into it. And, and I see now a different attitude to live streaming at conferences and stuff, which is which is really cool. That a lot more people are into it. And I think, like you say, a lot of them enjoyed it once they got a chance to do it. It was like a fun new thing to do. Yeah, like I think certainly quite a few people were, I think they got bit by the bug, as, as it were, mm. that, oh, right, I can do things. I can communicate and engage with my audience and you know with their audience is still you know the students that are coming to class but they can do it in a different way or mm. present things in a way that is you know particularly you know university lectures are often built around here's a lectern you're in a room everyone's sitting facing you and then it's like okay well I want to show you this one video that I've, I haven't got embedded <laughs> in my pdf slides so I need to back out and do this thing and set this up so I can play this thing and you could do all that more seamlessly as part of like yeah. a production and i think it was interesting also as a confidence booster as well because i had a few people asking about how intimidating it was about Mm. oh right i'm going to be talking to a camera for the next 45 50 minutes and my students are on the other end of like a chat window in this live stream and how do how do you how do you maintain your your energy and your morale for that and it's sort of like you got to think about it as a performance and you got to acknowledge that you're going to make you're going to slip up you're going to make mistakes not on this podcast we're 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 top professionals we're on top of it but you know in the grand scheme of things things are going to go wrong and allowing yourself the space to make those mistakes and roll with it i think is perfectly 
valid. And I remember trying to actually, one of the bits of advice I gave to a lot of lecturers was go watch Twitch. Like, do you know mm. what Twitch is? And they're like, what's a Twitch? I'm like, okay. Um, log on to twitch.tv and just watch some streamers playing games and just look at how they're able to interact with this, this very demanding activity while also engaging with an audience and reacting to the chat and all these other things that are going on. Like, that's super cool. Um, and yeah, that, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll be interested to see what the, the next generation of, of Twitch savvy university lecturers are like. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's funny, one of the things you said about your early phase of communication and your research, which, uh, yeah, that it really rings now is, Arguing 10 years ago that games based research, AI based research in games was a big, was, a, was not only a big deal, but a valid pursuit. And that doesn't, I don't think that's a, a question anymore. I think we've kind of addressed that. Yeah. Of, oh, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, there's some value in this. Like maybe, uh, maybe at some institutions are a little bit slow, a little bit behind still, but I think most places are recognizing it as. They're very keen for it. Like I was, I was really pleasantly surprised at how excited Kings had been to pursue more games research stuff. And um, apparently, a lot of AI funding bodies are very interested in supporting the games industry and games research now, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, like you say, like 10, 12 years ago, it wasn't clear. You know, AI wasn't really didn't seem to be going anywhere. And you know, people people knew AI in games. They understood that it, it makes the little people move around and stuff like that. Um, but there wasn't a feeling that it was, you know, a, a huge thing. And I think I was extremely lucky that I found someone willing to supervise a PhD in that area because I could easily have not found anyone and, and ended up in a completely different life, which would have been uh, very sad. I'm, I feel very lucky and happy to be where I am. I definitely echo that that sentiment. I had the same thing of just having someone who was generally interested in it. And it's funny when you talk about funding bodies as well. I remember writing grants where the use of the word game was, you, know, you had to err on the side of caution. Like, you know, it was like sort of how many times can you have expletives in a, in a PG-13 movie? Like you could only have so many swear words. Like you could only use the word game so many times before it was... <laughs> considered like sending a red flag it's like no it's a simulation yeah. or maybe it's a serious game um mm -hmm. rather than acknowledging it's an actual game game um and so i think <clears throat> particularly for your seeing yourself like a lot of your research has been about having building games that facilitate ai or having ai design and build those games and they're actually it's it's creating actual games that are designed to be played and designed to be entertained by like that's a that's an interesting shift i think in in that uh that environment because the artifact at the end of it is just a game which is fine whereas historically i think oh right what's your research doing oh it's making a game well it's, well, it's making a game that's not really solving the world's problems why are we doing this a bit but still not not really understanding that the 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 value of of that process i think you know yeah and of course as you know like <laughs> In, in academia, you have to apply for funding every now and again, and you have to explain why the research you're going to do is going to have a positive impact on something. Usually the three areas are society, industry, or research, other, other researchers. Um, and I, over time, I've, I've learned kind of how to talk about games and how, what kind of ideas inspire these funding bodies, like why they can see value in it. Um, but, but I'm sure most of the listeners of this podcast don't need to be convinced of that. Um, but I think there's so many reasons why it's it's good and exciting and meaningful to do research in this area. Um, and it's really made me happy that it, there's many things I don't like about the AI boom of the last decade, as anyone who follows me on Twitter will know. But I'm very grateful that it's enabled all of these other things. And it's funny, you, you were talking about your supervisor and, and my supervisor, PhD supervisors, you know, they were kind of, they weren't games researchers, quote unquote, but they were people who were yep. interested in it enough to to support it. And then there's the, like this phase of you and me where like we were kind of games researchers, but undercover games researchers maybe. <laughs> and now my PhD students today um, are, are just purely and, and openly like interested in games and, and absorbed in it. And I really like that generational shift you can see. It feels yeah. like AI research is just, gaming AI research rather, has just come on so much over the last couple of decades. And yeah, it's great to see. It's really wonderful to see. Like, yeah, certainly. Like, I think some of your own students, and then even other students that we're seeing coming up. It's 
I'm a game developer who's also doing research, which, and that also speaks to, I think, like the democratization of tools and the, the, the changing of the landscape that now anybody can be just on peak away or, you know, Unity or whatever. Like, oh yeah, I'm making my own stuff. I'm doing jams all the time. Oh, and this also now feeds into my research career as well. Like, I think, I don't know. I mean, I'll be interested to see how people <clears throat> who are on that scholarly path look at it nowadays, but it seems so much more plausible and attainable to be a games hmm. scholar than it hmm. was. Oh God, I realise I actually graduated from my undergraduate degree 19 years ago this year. Okay. We'll, we'll cut that bit out, Tommy. We'll cut just that bit out. Like yeah. A, 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 yeah. So yeah. it was like just last week I, I got my <laughs> undergraduate degree and I thought, no, no. But yeah, like the, the, the change of, our, you know, like you say, like both our supervisors were at the beginning of this um, wave of games AI research that really kicked off in the mid 2000s. And like, hey, this is a scientific community that was emerging and it was still niche at that point. To see that's now being so much more, I don't want to say, the word mainstream is maybe not appropriate, but at least mm. more accepted mm, and yeah. defined, I think, is, is, is super awesome. Um, yeah. And and sometimes like the, the students, I get the feeling that they don't feel like AI researchers because they've moved, they've moved further away from the picture of an AI researcher that that we represented. Just like I didn't feel like an AI researcher when I moved away from what I saw other people doing, and I explained to them that actually no, this is how you, what you're doing is you're evolving the definition of AI research. You're you're finding things that are important to you and you're changing it. And my students' students will hopefully benefit from that as well. So it's, yeah, it's nice. It's God, nice if you told me that in the earlier phase of my career, I would have felt so much better. Um, yeah, right, right. Because <laughs> I think, I mean, we we're not even actually focusing on like the key, th we're not actually getting to the main meat of this of this episode yet, but you know, this is just the <laughs> warm up. but um, this is proven therapeutic. I remember, because I used to publish in a lot of, so you know, if you're not if you're not someone who's who's active in this community, like a big part of your 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 ongoing activity and development as a as a scholar is that you do research and then you publish it. So you have to write up papers, you submit them to conferences, and then you actually go to those conferences and present that work and to the community. And it's all refereed and vetted by the community. So you're it's kind of intimidating because you're writing something which then people whose work that you've read and, and respect is they're going to critique it and then tell you whether or not it's good enough. And I remember I used to come from, <clears throat> so I came from the IEEE community. So the Institution of Electrical and Engin Electronic Engineers. So it was all very scientific and it's all very data driven and it's all pretty graphs and nice tables. And you have to be able to show through your statistical tests that what you'd done was valid and, I remember like in the early phase after graduating my PhD in the early phase of my research career, trying to figure out how to become more of a general game scholar with an interest in AI and how difficult I found that because I felt like I was cheating. I felt like I yeah. was breaking from the rules that had been defined for me. And mm -hmm. it, it took a few years of meeting actually people like yourself and <laughs> not, that, not that I'm saying that, you know, you didn't do the same rigorous science, but being able to see how other people approach it and the kind of, type of work that they were producing and going, oh, hey, that's valid and that's okay. And and like you say yourself, like redefining what a game AI researcher is, I think it, if I'd heard that kind of statement, oh, but 10 years ago, I think that would have done me the world of good because I remember how <laughs> stressful I found that, like carving Definitely. out. Because, you know, you, you, you sit your PhD, so both of us have sat and completed our PhDs and you get to the end of it and it's what it really tells you is, Okay, you can be left unsupervised to conduct research. Go and conduct research. Okay. Now what? And <laughs> what do you mean I can just do whatever I like? But no, there's rules and there's yeah, there, there's almost so many unwritten rules that you need to figure out along the way. And so many, yeah. yeah. Oh dear. Right. What we'll do is we'll take a quick break. And then we'll come back. And actually, what we're gonna we're gonna dig in a little bit more into Mike's particular career path, as it were. And we're gonna talk particularly about. I think we'll focus start with on your research because your research is in automated game design, or at least that's where it started out. And we can talk a little yep. bit about what that even means. <laughs> and so we'll jump off for a little break now, unless, of course. You've signed up to support us over on the AI and Games Patreon because if you've signed up at, at patreon.com forward slash AI and Games, you'll get to listen to these ad free. 
Plus, you also get some bonus stuff as well. So if you're on a, if you're a patron, we'll be back right after this. If not, you're going to listen to a sponsor, which is probably done in my voice. <laughs> And we're back. Thank you for not listening to our ads or listening to our ads, depending on depending on where you are and what you're doing and whether you support us or not. But we're happy you're here. We're here to get right. into we're here to get into. So every episode for the first four episodes, we're sitting down with each of our co-hosts to dig a little bit more into their lives to find out all their secrets. But no, rather just to find out a little bit more about them. What what's their passion? What drives them? And so for Mike in particular, we were kind of looking at your research career. And mm. like you say, you know, you're someone who's a game AI researcher. You're someone who does a lot of involvement publicly. You talk about, you know, making games as well as part of your research. And what it, I'm kind of also, it's kind of curious. We've both been down this path, but also getting a feeling of what does it mean to make games as a researcher? Mm. And like, how do you develop from that? So your research field, as it started, I'm not quite sure if you would still define it as such, but you know your field is automated game design. Mm -hmm. So, for the audience, for everyone, humor is. What do we mean when we're talking about automated game design? So, actually, over the last few years, I've been trying to practice like a few sentences that I can put at the start of papers to define it. But the way I usually define it is it's it's building an AI system that either supports or participates in or does the act of game design um, all on its own. So. Uh, this might be something like giving intelligent feedback to a level designer. Um, but mostly when we talk about automated game design, we talk about whole game generations. So an AI designing a game itself, taking as much creative responsibility as possible, um, and then putting those games out into the world and maybe learning from, from feedback and, and talking to people. Um, and something I focus on in particular is, is I sometimes describe it as automating the person, not the task. So I'm not just interested in building an AI that can design a game and, and put a game out in the world. I want the, the AI to be able to do the things that game designers do, talk to people, um, talk to their audience, learn from other designers. Like I want to think about what is the role of a game designer in society or in the games industry or in the games culture? Um, and I want to look at how AI can participate in that a bit too. And yeah, like, so critically, I think with a lot of your research, there's always been a, a mechanism to facilitate that conversation or the idea that the, the designer is either responding to something that is directly said to it or it's feeding on um, the public, I don't know, mm. uh, the public voice or mm. you're trying to encourage discussion off the back of a game that is created as well. And like, I think all your research that you've done dating back even to your earliest works where you had it reading like Guardian news feeds, <laughs> for example. Um, actually, fun fact, for those of you who are um, viewers of the AI and Games YouTube channel, if you go back to episode 20, which was quite a few years ago now, um, <laughs> it is an episode entirely about the first phase of, of Mike's work, of his PhD, actually, um, which culminated in a project called Angelina. and. Yeah, like one of the interesting things is you're you know you're getting the you're creating games with the gener with your systems and then it's getting submitted to game jams or you're getting it to read news feeds to figure out an aesthetic or a mood. So you're always trying to figure out a way to I guess could you give a an overview of like what's the different ways you've tried to facilitate that idea of the designer communicating or broadly? Yeah, I think I think something which I like doing, which is there, there are lots of strategies for doing research, right? One is to kind of look at how people are currently doing something and see if you can improve it. Another is to look at something which no one's done before and just think like, what's kind of the stupidest way I could think of doing this? <laughs> or or like, or like, why has no one done this before? Is there a good reason or has just, has just, have we just thought, not thought to do it? Um, and often you try these things and you make a mess and I love making a mess. Um, so often... I was looking at things like, you know, what do game designers do that we're not already doing? Um, so entering game jams was something I was doing when I was learning to make games. Um, and so I thought, this is a really interesting creative challenge. It's kind of well constrained. It's a chance to get feedback. Um, so um, it felt like it felt like it would be an interesting thing to do. Um, so we've done, yeah, we've done game jams. Um, we've done, um, I had a system 
sort of contribute design to a game that I made for the Android um, mobile store with um, kind of player feedback. Players could rate each level. So we did kind of like a study on how they liked the, yeah. the, the stuff that it had designed. Um, we did the Guardian news articles, as you said. And during that phase, um, I also had a Twitter bot. So Angelina could ask questions on Twitter and then get live feedback from the people that followed it. That was another really interesting experiment. And then in the later versions of Angelina, um, it was designed to kind of be uh, either run on Twitch or at events. We went to EGX Resed and we had a booth there. Um, and you could kind of answer questions for the system. So you could you could say, I want to help you. What do you want to know? And the system would ask questions like, does it make sense for a witch to eat cheese? You know, and then if people people could vote yes or no, it would put this into its knowledge base. And then if it needed to kind of think of a theme for its game, it would have like an understanding of the connections between concepts. Um, and so I've tried a lot of different things over over time. The latest thing I'm looking at is something which I've always wanted to do, which is the ability to describe games that this system can then go and play. And the reason why that's important is because. If you think about AI and a lot of other creative domains like art, um, if you've got an art generating AI, you can show it pictures really easily because the representation of a picture in digital form is very standardized. You know, it's a grid of pixels. Right. But the representation for games is completely different. So every AI I've made, I can't show it other games easily. Um, but now, now we can sort of describe simple games, which means I can show my system like this is Noughts and Crosses. You know, this is Connect Four. These are games that are considered classics. They're considered really important games. See if you can learn something from this. And I think that's quite an exciting opportunity for more dialogue between humans and, and the AI. All right. Oh, that's that's pretty exciting. I didn't know about any of this. This is uh, this is really exciting to me. I guess like. Um... I wonder one of the things I, I thought was I've, I've thought about previously actually because you did the stuff where you show you had your 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 the build of the system at EGX Res you've actually got the audience in there like the did it end up do you end up with it situations where you get so much feedback it ends up kind of min maxing into this creative lo like local optima where it's sort of all right well all my games are now going to converge largely around this because all the feedback I've been given is you know everything should be a battle royale now. You know, there's a very contrived <laughs> example, but it's like everything should be a battle royale right now because everyone's just telling me that's what it should do. Does it ever end up getting into that kind of direction where the the variation between generated output is diminished by virtue of increased amount of feedback that it receives? So I've never done feedback for the system <clears throat> in the terms of like, is this game good or bad? Although that that is something which I'm beginning to experiment with with the new system called Puck. Um, where people can kind of say, I like this game or I don't like this game. Um, I want there to be a bit of a teaching process there. Right. But in the previous systems, you could only kind of give it knowledge. So you couldn't kind of really direct it. Um, you could only kind of gently give it information about like, this is what the world looks like or, or, or that kind of thing. Um, despite that, I did like, you do notice some interesting quirks. So one story that I used to tell about Angelina was that uh, when I set the Twitter bot up, Angelina would ask questions via Twitter and then aggregate responses. And people would lie to Angelina. They would, <laughs> they would find it funny because they'd be kind of like curious as to what would happen, I think. And then one day I told them, oh, by the way, this system records everything you tell it and it remembers who told it what. And everyone stopped lying after that point, <laughs> uh, which, which I think is amazing because a lot of them did develop a kind of like in a way, like not a relationship, but like the relationship you have with maybe a pet or maybe a plant, a house plant. Like you talk to it, you you kind of project onto it. Um, and people didn't want Angelina to remember it as a liar, I think. Remember them as a liar. Um and the other thing that was fun was that when we when we demoed it at Rezd, um, it wasn't just that you could answer questions. You could also propose new things. You could tell it, like, this is a thing that exists in the world that you might want to know about. And that was really funny. Like, people were people were teaching it, like, all kinds of weird facts. And it was really funny to just... You know, this this wouldn't be the case if I released it online on the internet, but people were just nice to it. Like they wanted to help it, which was really interesting. And, and I think maybe there is something in the way I've presented the project to people where they feel I've tried to give them a sense of like, this is this is something that I want you to work with. It's something I want you to befriend. I want you to feel a responsibility towards it. And I think that kind of culture does affect how people interact with the system. So 
I, I, I do I do like that kind of thing. So there, there hasn't been like a, a tight convergence. But what I would like is there to be personalization in the future. So the thing with Puck is that everyone can have their own version of it. And that means I want your version to kind of pick up some of your personality or your likes. Um, and that doesn't mean the AI can't subvert that. Um, that was something my my PhD supervisor, Simon Colton, was very big into. Like, if an AI learns what you want, that means it can also give you what you don't want. And that can be an interesting thing, too. So maybe maybe future AI will challenge us. Uh, if it notices everyone wants battle royales, maybe it will actually <laughs> intentionally kind of subvert that, um, which could be fun. Yeah. Like, I think, I mean, that's actually quite an interesting idea as well, because, you know, you want to... I've, I've been personally, actually, over the last year or so i guess like playing a lot of games i've actually been trying to get out of my own comfort zone i've been tr mm. i've been trying stuff that um i historically haven't played or i've looked at it and went oh that's not my cup of tea and thought you know what everyone seems to be talking about this i should go and play it um is this actually my cup of tea and nice. sometimes trying things <clears throat> like uh, actually i'll give some examples so i actually played my first pokemon to completion ah, i have cool. never Pokemon kind of came out a little bit later than I, I, I it kind of the original Pokemon like uh, tri <laughs> trilogy is it were the original colors. Um, they all came out a little bit later into my teens, and I think at that point I'd kind of lost interest in it, or I just mm -hmm. wasn't engaging with it. And so I tried playing my first Pokemon, and I was like, oh, here's the things I like and don't like about it, and whether I want to go back. And I've actually played another Pokemon game since then, That's or like cool. playing more JRPGs. Or ah, okay. um, certain puzzle games that aren't really my cup of tea. I was like, you know what? Well, let's just let's just go out there. And so I think there's something interesting about. Well, well, this isn't necessarily something that you've suggested you like, but it might be something that you discover you find interesting by virtue mm. of just experimenting with it. And so I kind of yeah. like that idea of because when you say you don't like something, what you're really saying is you've just you've never expressly di dictated that you like it. And so there's then scope that you could actually find stuff. Right. Um, that you know, you end up battling down into some, he says, knee deep in Yakuza at the moment. I've discovered the Yakuza <laughs> series, and it is now one of my favorite things. And I'm surprised it's taken me this long to play it. But you know, kind of that notion of finding new things and challenging your your horizons, I guess, a little bit. And in a way, that's also kind of one of the jobs you have to have as a researcher, right? Is that you have to look at the way the world is already going and think, okay, I don't need to help it go that way because it's already doing that. What are the other ways I could check out just to make sure we're not missing anything? Um, and I feel like that's that's another thing that an AI could be really good at. Um, and actually, I've been thinking a lot about recommender systems lately. So those are the systems that give you Netflix suggestions or create playlists for you on Spotify. And I've been talking with other researchers at King's who are interested in these systems because they're really bad. They they don't work <laughs> like recommendations. You know, like if I ask you for a recommendation right now, you could recommend me a game that you think might challenge me. Um, but Netflix isn't going to do that. Netflix just wants you to watch as much as possible. So, yeah, I, I also like that. I like the idea that these AI could actually come up with things that might be a little bit different or give us personal recommendations as in personal to the AI, not personal to us. Like the <laughs> AI is obsessed with this game and it thinks you should be as well. Like that kind of thing. <laughs> um, like I started playing vampire survivors a couple of months ago. Yep. I just don't know what it is about that. I don't like it. I don't think I like <laughs> it, but I've played it for like 30 hours. I don't understand it. It's, it's I just do not understand it. I, I keep thinking like, I don't thing. like this. Like, <laughs> At this, I don't think I, I don't think I bounced off it. I was sort of this isn't for me. I don't really understand. I, I I'm critically. I think this is one of the things I've been trying to do when I've been playing a lot of games recently. Is maybe this isn't for me, but I'm trying to understand why it's mm. so en enticing to other people. Yeah. And I was I had the same thing with Vampire Survivors. Of okay, this isn't quite my thing. I kind of see why people really dig it. Oh, hang on a minute. I've played this for 25 hours now and my Steam Deck has ran out of battery again. And like, yeah. okay, maybe I do like this. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I actually still don't know with Vampire Survivors if I like it or not, but I, I have now clocked about 27 hours in it and I bought the DLC. Yeah, I'm so, the same. I'm the same. But I'm not sure if I like this is but, like one of those. Is this is like one of those though. Steam reviews you get, where it's like played it for four hundred hours. It's <laughs> yeah. not a good game. Yes, exactly. That was exactly the instinct I had with it as well. Um, but but that that kind of thing is great, and I think it's really cool that you're you're playing things that you that you think you know you you wouldn't normally pick, and then trying to trying to take them apart. I think that's really good, and I think. Um, 
there's been a lot of debate in in game AI research. I think about like should game AI researchers make games? Should they play games? Should they even like games? Like, do they need to? And I think the answer to all of those questions is no. They don't. They don't need to. Um, but some of us should. There should be like a group of us that do because I think it produces new and interesting perspectives. Um, and I don't know how you found transitioning. Not that you transitioned, but like picking up game design as a skill. Um, I think I'm I'm a much less experienced game designer than you, but I find it hard to think about game design in sort of a proper way. Like I'm often just completely going on feel. I don't have a language for it. You know, we we didn't take game design courses or anything. No. Um, so I think it's really interesting that you're kind of taking this game and being like, why do people like this? What can I, how can I put this into words? I think that's very valuable. Yeah, I think it, it's become a, a useful exercise in establishing my own lexicon a little bit. Like, I'm trying to read up and, and learn a little bit as as I go. Mm. Um, but yeah, you, as you kind of say, like in our careers, quote unquote, we didn't have that opportunity arise. And even mm. like, I think it's, it's different now. Like you kind of see aspiring PhD candidates and what have you who are doing game jams in their first week. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, encouraging them to make games. And this conversation of like, oh, are you allowed to make games as part of your 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 research? like. You know, it, it's it's interesting. I think we both came up in a time when making games was still considered odd, or Definitely. you know, you you made enough to facilitate the research that you were going to publish. You didn't then yeah. turn it into an actual game. That like it someone... was a huge deal when <clears throat> Prom Week Prom Week was right. uh, made by some of our friends at, at UC Santa Cruz, I think it was, and that was a massive deal. Like, oh my god, this is a real thing, and it's winning awards and stuff. That was so unusual. Yeah, it's an actual game. It's it's yeah. not a little. I mean, you know, a, a quirky experiment that that you've yeah. you've made and put on your website, and then you're hoping maybe three people and a dog will, will ever have a look at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I think that's that's changed the the conversation quite a bit, and it, it, I think it's enriched a lot of the 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 conversation that happens in kind of game AI research, and also subsequently it has empowered a lot of newer people um, yeah. who are coming into the field because. You, 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 like you said there about whether they play games or even what their cultural references are to games. Like we were joking, I think, earlier about <laughs> how both of our supervisors had very dated con concepts of what games are. And even if you look at some of the earliest competitions around training AI to play games, it was all Atari games, mm -hmm. you know? Like Super Mario Brothers was kind of really pushing it. We are like, oh, right, we've went, you know, after the... Um, after the, the the industry collapse, uh, you know, it was all Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man. Oh, what if you could get something that could play Lunar Lander? Like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And even as you're when in the early two thousands, when we are uh, both at university or mid two thousands, we're like, I don't know if I played that one. I have to Google that <laughs> and figure out what that game is. Like I like I said, um, I think off off camera earlier, like my earliest research was based on the Atari twenty six hundred game Combat, which came out six years before I was born, and I'd never played it. So yeah, and and but you're trying to talk to your PhD supervisor about what's happening in games like I don't know contemporary first person shooters or strategy games. Like, have you ever played Age of Empires or Starcraft? Or like, what's a Starcraft? Or um, like, what's the big games that were that were in the conversation? around 2005, 2006, that we thought were leading to interesting discussions around the research we were doing. And I remember spending quite a bit of time educating my supervisor uh, on games, and I convinced him to get an Xbox at one point, oh, an wow. Xbox 360. And he's like, what should I play? And I'm like, these are the games you should be playing, and this is why they're interesting. And he actually went oh. out and played a whole bunch of them. And he's like, I'm learning a lot right now. That's amazing. That's <laughs> Here, really play great. Life for Dead. Like, oh right, director AI and like play fear and stuff like that. You know? <laughs> it's kinda of... I think also like as we as we allow allow and encourage students to sort of experiment and make things, I think one thing that I'm really enjoying seeing in, in my own students in particular is this identity of an AI researcher who's also an artist and a creator. And it feels it has a different feel. It has a different feel to the research they produce because they're not just asking questions that are of interest to AI. I think like you were saying earlier, it's no longer like this This is AI first and games happen to be there. There's the, there are these questions of like, actually, this is only going to benefit games and that's fine. And we're going we're gonna to explore this and we're going to ask questions that I care about. And that's really exciting. 
And it never only benefits games. That's the thing with science mm. and research. It <clears throat> always benefits other things. You just don't know further down the line. But I, I feel this this sense of like novelty and freedom and excitement in in a lot of the research I see these days. And it, it's um it's really encouraging. It's really cool. Yeah, it, 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 I I envy them in, in so many ways, but also I think I'd probably have some sort of analysis paralysis if I did that. Like, sort of, what's the <laughs> where where could I go? I don't think I'm creative enough um, in in some regards. But uh, I, I think it also speaks to like there's a new wave of research that's coming out, which I think is appropriate because, like you say, like starting out, it was all. <sighs> AI research for the sake of AI that happens to involve games. And that was often how we used games as benchmarks as a mechanism to justify the work we were doing. Like, oh, hey, let's try and yeah. train it. Let's try and write an AI that can play StarCraft or something like that. And, and, that, and that, that pursuit is still ongoing. But um, the change in recent years on account of this massive investment from corporations into this space, like we were all academics with small you know we're, we're maybe applying for government funding or or what have you and and the great you know this was great that you were getting that but um in the grand scheme of things compared to the financial investment by big corporations into this kind of work it's very little yeah. meanwhile they're investing tens of millions of dollars into oh we've now got a bunch of ai bots that can play dota 2 together or they can play starcraft right. together and i think that's forced the community as a whole to change how they approach it, that it's no longer about trying to attain yeah. those milestones because mm. on one hand you can't compete. And I think also there's now a valid question of as a, as an, as a, as an independent researcher, if, you know, you, you work at a university, but by and large, your research follows you, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're, you're creating your own career there. Like, is that something that you want to, invest that amount of time into when you're competing with something like that and does it even feel appropriate or relevant to you anymore when you could like you said yeah. um a minute ago like that 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 research is happening that direction is coming so you're like okay yeah. well do i need to invest time in it anymore can i maybe go and do something at, like invest in the weird if you will that's that's a great that's a great point and in a way it kind of reminds me of how we think about indie versus AAA game development right like indie yeah. studios wouldn't try and make like a prestige military shooter because you'd be competing with Call of Duty and it would be a nightmare so they want to look for they want to try and stand out and be different um, and I definitely I think that's a that's a really insightful perspective obviously for some people. I mean, it, it, you know, academics are still making great strides in areas like playing StarCraft 2 because there were still like problems that, that um, OpenAI and DeepMind didn't solve in those games. Yeah, yeah. Um, and some people, you know, they want to go and get jobs working for OpenAI. So they want to like demo that they want to show that they can solve like classic problems. Um, but we're seeing a lot more of like the cool, the cool weird stuff. And I think that's a great, that's a great insight into why that is. I think definitely that's a factor, yeah. And I, th I guess for you, like, so you've made quite a few, Actually, out of curiosity, do you know how many games you've actually made? I mean, it, um, probably a lot I mean, more than I have. I have I have no games listed on Steam, so like <laughs> everyone has a different idea of like what that means, right? Um, but yeah, I've made like I've made like a dozen or so like things that I would describe as games, um, and then there's a bunch of other smaller projects which I've really enjoyed. I've been writing up a series on on co-host um, where I just found some of my abandoned projects and, and wrote about them, which was really fun. Um, and thinking about like why I abandoned them was also fun. Um, but yeah, I've made a bunch of things. Um, Critically, does any of the games that are made, but do you consider yourself to have any co-authorship of any of the stuff that like Angelina or like Puck has made? No, um, apart from the Android game, which uh, I did some of the art for and like I built the rough structure of, I selected the levels, but I don't consider myself to have any authorship in any of those games. And it's actually funny because there's a lot of conversations right now about legal ownership over AI creations and things like mm. that. And I, there's a lot of like things that I really don't approve of going on in that space. Um, <laughs> but on, on Puck's website in the FAQ, one of the things I point out is that, so someone says like, I think one of the FAQs is something like, um, who owns the games that Puck designs. And in the answer I've explained, I can't tell you who owns them because I'm not a lawyer and it's complicated. And if Puck if Puck reinvents Connect 4, that doesn't mean that you own it or Puck. <laughs> it exists. <laughs> um, so the only thing I can tell you is that me, 
and Puck, we we do not claim ownership over anything that that the system produces. Um, and I think that's the only ethical stance I can take right now is I don't know who owns it, but I'm saying it's not me. Um, and I feel the same way about authorship. Uh, yeah. And so, I mean, even then, you've still made quite a few games, I guess, like, I mean, something I'm just generally interested in was like your motivation doing that. Was this always something that was running in tandem with your research? And was a l- how often does like the, the games that you're making and the research you're doing, does that overlap? Or do you actually mm. create games that are counter-programming because you're so sick of <laughs> dealing... I'm so sick of dealing with this automated game design problem right now. I'm just going to make something that is completely you know disassociated from that. Like, what's that so been like? I started out... <clears throat> I've, I've always wanted to make games like since I was like eight years old, but I never really could until I started my PhD. And I used it as a tool to kind of, I was like pathfinding ahead of where Angelina was going. So if I wanted to make Angelina make Metroidvania games, I would make one as practice. And I would understand like, oh, these are the, these are the bits I need. These are the bits that Angelina will have to design. So I, I was kind of learning game design alongside my AI systems. Um, and then over time, I got a bit more experimental. And I think these days, there's two types of projects I work on. One are things where there is something interesting I want to explore. And it often is, there often is a research question. I mean, we talked about like the identity of, of what it means to be an AI researcher. And lately, I've just felt more and more like, you know, our jobs are just, um, they're just something we found, we've convinced someone to pay us to do, right? <laughs> like who I am as a person, um, if, if I was like, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I would still do a lot of the research I do, um, but I would do a lot of other things that I can't justify as research. And and sometimes I'll have an idea and I think, okay, this is a research project. And other times I'll have an idea and I think, this isn't, but it would make a cool game. So like I have some prototypes where I'm like, what, what does it mean to put this in a game? How does that change the design? But there are definitely projects that, like, like you say, are counter-programming. Um, and something that I've really enjoyed is like, Making things for the sake of it, I've realized I just like making things move on a screen, um, <laughs> and it's it's just fun and relaxing. Uh, I've begun lecturing about game design, my my history of game design recently. I got invited to speak about it, and I told people about a game called Dog Force that I made, um, and I made that game when I was taking breaks from my PhD thesis, and there's absolutely no AI or procedural generation in it at all. It was just a fun game about being a dog. And it was, I made it as therapy kind of. Um, and I'm, I'm doing more of that lately. I've taken up pixel art and things like that. I'm trying to find um, things that I can do that aren't directly to do with my job. And yes. I'm sure your brain works the same way. It, eventually I find ways to bring it back in. Um, but <clears throat> but it's really satisfying to, to broaden your horizons and to try new things. And it makes you a better researcher as well, I think. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think... Actually, the my drive to experiment and try different types of games was also to get me to make playing games a bit more fun again. Mm. Like I, I say that as if I've like you know drained the fun out of video <laughs> games, but really, when um, as, as someone who's a content creator and you're making a lot of uh, videos about stuff, like I can tell you at any given time how many games I'm playing for the purposes of making a video oh, at boy, some point yeah. and. There's a list right now. I'm playing about five different games because some of them it's like, oh, I'm recording it right now or it's, I need to get good at this game so that I could record it or even I've never played this game and I need to experience it so that I have context. And then subsequently you're, what started, you know, but you said like, we we find ways to take our hobbies and turn them into work. He (laughs) says now running his YouTube channel um, as a semi-professional bit. And so suddenly it's like, all right, well, I've got a production schedule. I actually have like time allocated to playing games, <laughs> not for fun. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully, I might have fun along the way. Yeah, <laughs> but and and yeah, like interestingly, like I've been investing a little bit more in my own my self care, as it were, looking <laughs> at hobbies that are that are disassociated from that. But can I do something that isn't those things? And even actually recently, I've been trying to find more physical tangible nice. real world things to do yes. that are away from a screen because even all my hobbies at one point oh, i was making games as a hobby i then turned that into work i'm making videos as a hobby now that's turned into work and i'm on my desk all the time and it was like yeah. sort of from a mental health perspective it seemed really valuable to me to just get away from that you know yeah um 
Wow, I no, just took I, his I took his dinner tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's great. And and I, I think it's so something I see a lot on Twitter, and I don't know how you feel about this, is that they say that oh, you know, game game designers should read more books, um, and or or insert other media form here. And I have mixed feelings about it because I think I think it's it's fine to just play games if that is something that matters a lot to you. But there is a there is a lovely benefit from doing other things. And um and the thing I've loved most about doing art is being bad at it, you know, because <laughs> I just you have to worry about everything when you when you're doing stuff for work. Um, but with art, it's like this sucks and it's great. I'm loving it. I'm loving how bad this is. Um I think I, I used to be a um I used to be I used to review games for Pocket Gamer uh, when I was an undergraduate student. Um oh, wow. and uh, it was a it was a really fun gig. Uh but as you say, there were times where I was like, well, I've got to play this game this week and then I've got to write about it. And it doesn't matter whether I'm in the mood. Like people think it's, it is a fun job and it can be, you know, it's great to play games for a living or think about games for a living, but there are days where just like any other job, you don't want to do it or you're too tired or, you know, you'd rather be doing something else. And you not, can't. not every game, no not every game you're playing is the best game ever. Sometimes yeah. you're going to play that game that is not the best game ever. And you're like, I, yeah. I've got another eight hours of this to do. Yeah, that's the funny thing. That, that was something which that, that gig made me realize. Like, lots of people say, like, "Oh, this game, this game should have got like a three out of ten. It's terrible." That's because most people have never played an actual three out of ten video game. They don't know what a three <laughs> out of ten looks like. And when you're strapped <laughs> into one for five hours, then then you really get a feeling for it. Strapped um, in, yeah. love it. It's like you're going nowhere until you get through this. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 the the one the one thing that I often have to deal with and and this is something that i'm very particular about and i'm very careful about and i've talked about it in other places before is sometimes i will make videos about games that i think are technically interesting but god i hate them that's um, really interesting yeah and but it's also very important to me that the audience doesn't pick up on that it's like no because this could be your favorite game you've ever played and then mm. oh my god tommy's made a video on ai and games about this game and I want to hear what he has to say oh this has been my favorite episode of ai and games because he talked about the game that i love and then it's like Oh, what did you think of the game? I'm like, if I never have to play that game again, I will be a happy man. Um, but and it is it. I think that's taught me a lot actually about just respecting other people's opinions about these things and and appreciating that. Yeah, just because, just because something is respected or or, or admired by a broader community doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to embrace it. And I think that's fine. Um, but it, it's 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 an interesting pocket of a lot of the stuff that I do where mm. I will spend 10, 12 hours playing a game to get enough recording footage to record a 25 minute YouTube video. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. And it's like I didn't enjoy this experience. And then other times I'm surprised. And I think that's also, that's also one of the best things about it is sometimes people are like, could you please make a video about this game? I'm like, OK, fine. I do the research. And then somewhere in amongst it, I'm like, actually, I quite like this, this despite yeah. And again, it's like that challenging yourself because you look at it at first and go, nah, not my cup of tea. Um, yeah. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because as a, as a game designer, you're told you need to focus on that first half an hour because you need to grab people. And so many games are tuned to have like a perfect first hour. But there are lots of games that hide all sorts of gems eight hours in. And it's not that that makes them good. It's not that you can be like, oh, it gets better after the first eight hours. Like that sucks. But as a game developer or a designer or an, an analyst or a researcher, Actually, that's kind of you do want to see that sometimes. Like there are some games that there there are some experiences that you can only adequately have after hundreds of hours. Um, speaking as a Dota two player, <laughs> um, but but you know, it, but it's true. Like I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to anyone, but I've definitely attained so, uh, an experience that I couldn't have otherwise, which is which is interesting. So yeah, that's cool. It, let me ask you a question: Is that why you ended up um, getting your kind of more personal gameplay videos so that you could kind of? vent some of those feelings about games alongside with, without the ai stuff a, a little a little bit a little bit it was a, a particularly like that's how design dive actually manifested was because i was really thinking about other games and i didn't and i, I knew this wasn't a technical video about mm. the ai in it but i was interested in how the ai supports the the design of it and that was where that series came from and actually because the first episode of that series is about Titanfall 2, which I could put me on a podium and give me a duration. I will talk about Titanfall 2 to any audience. Like I still think Titanfall 2 is one of the greatest games that has ever been made. I have such love for that game on so many levels. And 
that was it. It was sort of that was the impetus that created that that entire YouTube series was just mm. I need to talk about Titanfall two and why it's so good and why I think it's so interesting. Um and that's yeah, that's been it's also been an you know, yeah, we were saying earlier about branching out in your research career and trying different things and then feeling the confidence and whether or not what you're doing is quote unquote right based on what you've already established. I did it to myself with my own YouTube videos. <laughs> like I still to this day find it difficult writing design dive because mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm, I should be writing that series. It's like, right. you're not a real game designer. You don't know what you're talking about. But also that has also been some of the most successful videos I've ever made is people have resonated with the, with the stories that, that, that those videos tell. And that's been, I, I always find that an interesting exercise, whether or not it's, is this just turning into a glorified game review? Is this turning, <laughs> you know, am I critiquing? Um, there's actually a video I did last year, which I'm very proud of, which is about Doom Eternal, um, which was actually, the, 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 that episode title should be called I don't like Doom Eternal and I'm having trouble dealing with it. And that's what it should have been called. And it <clears throat> that's actually what the video is about, is me reconciling this is how Doom Eternal has changed from the, the previous game and the, that reboot mm. series. I've, my, my opinion on it has softened since. I think it's good. But I don't think it's great. And so I remember playing it at the time and really bouncing off of it and going, I don't like this. And so it's, it was an exercise in me revisiting the game and playing it again and then figuring out how can I actually formalise a critique of this game that pull, that takes my personal investment out of it. Hmm. And um, that is probably my favourite video I made last year because I, I think I pulled it off. Um, it didn't get that many views, but I'm, I'm proud of it because it, it was an exercise in me trying to figure out how to talk about games without that personal investment in it despite the fact that was a series that was created as a result of my personal investment. So yeah, it's, it, it, it was an interesting exercise. It's always the way your, your favorite papers never get as many citations either. Um, but, uh, oh, but yeah. you still love making them. So that's, that's cool. <laughs> yes. Yes. I've been there. Like, I was, do you ever find that, like, I, I was going to say, like looking at the type of research that you've done, it has been quite broad. Do you ever feel like, so some of your work has, has received quite a lot of um, acclaim, both internally within the community. You've had Best Paper Awards, quite a few actually in the last couple of years. Um, congratulations on that. I think you've hit your stride. But also you have a lot of, as if you were like phoning it in for the last 10 years, I apologise. <laughs> but also critically, like you get a lot of uh, public exposure to your work you know um critically uh websites like rock paper shotgun have covered your research over the years do you ever feel like there's stuff that you've done that's never really got the love that you felt it deserved or something that you were very proud of that the rest of everyone else kind of just shrugged at um so i i used to i used to talk about mechanic minor when people asked me this question which was um some research i did where we kind of invented game mechanics in this interesting way um but actually a lot of people have kind of read that more lately and i think it's i think i think it's gotten the love it it, it deserved now but there is one paper that i really liked that i didn't i certainly didn't expect like rock paper shotgun to write about it but um it always it was a struggle to get it published, and I published it at co the Computational Creativity Conference, which is not the biggest conference. And even there, they were kind of like uh, most people were like, huh? Um, <laughs> but I tried to invent um, opinions uh, for for AI uh, in code. Um, <laughs> and by this, I don't mean like I don't mean like they actually had opinions. Um, but what I mean is like bits of code that that look and function like opinions. So I was thinking about like what does it mean when someone has a favorite color. Um, and it means things like, well, it's not contradictory, um, it's consistent. So if you ask me my favorite color tomorrow, it will probably be the same. Um, and I came up with these criteria and I used them to generate little snippets of code. And I showed how, because one, one of the real challenges with building a creative AI is that most creative decisions are not rational. You, you can't explain them. Like some game hmm. design decisions, you can say, well, I did this because of X, Y, Z. But um, if you look at my my lovely video background today, you know, why were those colors chosen? Why was that plant chosen? Like, it's not necessarily, there isn't always a good decision. A lot of them are just gut feelings. And AI don't have guts. So lots of the time, you would just replace those decisions with a random number generator or a dice yeah. roll. 
But the problem with dice rolls is that there's nothing to engage with as a as an as an observer. So if we look at this uh, this the still, it's from a Ghibli movie, I think. You know, if we watch all of their movies or the rest of this movie, we might notice, oh, these colors come up consistently or these themes come up consistently or things. So I was really interested in how can we give AI um, the ability to make decisions that are arbitrary. They don't have any basis in anything, but they they form a pattern. Um, and I ended up doing it. I ended up like generating these little bits of code that represented like a favorite color or, um, you know, a bias towards choosing a particular enemy type for a particular area or things like that. Um, and I, it was partly on me for not integrating it into a system, but it was really hard to explain to people. Like it, it did sound kind of mad when I was explaining it to people. Um, it sounds mad even <laughs> as I'm saying it here, but, but I think there was something in it because putting, putting a random number generator in your AI just feels bad because then people are like, oh, why did it choose that color? And you're just like, oh, it, it just did it randomly. Um, whereas if you notice like this AI loves red, why is that? Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily need an answer, but the fact that you notice that it loves red is really interesting. Um, I, so yeah, think, that's, that's like, so that's something I'd love to do more of. Um, like, I think, I do think that's really interesting though, because funnily enough, you kind of tapped into this notion that, and you see this a lot. I think, you know, players are becoming increasingly more savvy of generative systems and the use of procedural mm. content generation as part of games. And so people are catching out, oh, was that, a, is is it generating this artifact because of uh, some designer authorial control or just, oh, the random number generator made it so that that was the thing? And yeah. you rob you rob authorial intent from it. If, particularly if, if people think that that is it, oh, just the system made that decision, you're like, all right, well, you can't then argue, oh, no, that was a, that was a creative decision that had some basis in, in something to do with the identity of the creator. I need, I've never actually seen this bit of work. I need to dig this out. This sounds, when did you do this? <laughs> oh, it was like in 2015 or something oh, like really? that. It was, it was a while back. Um, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know if we're, if we're doing show notes for this, but I can, I can hook out a link. <laughs> yeah, we should it dig sometime. it out, stick um, it in the show notes. Why not? But um, yeah, I, I don't know. That, that it's just one of those pieces of work that you do. You don't do for any reason. You don't do it for any like deadline or, or objective. Um, and then, but then you submit it. Actually, I should shout out, there's there's another piece of work, which I can't say that it hasn't been um, celebrated enough yet because it's not actually published yet, but it's just been accepted a few days ago. So some of your viewers might be, um, and some of our listeners uh, might be familiar with the thousand bowls of oatmeal problem. I feel like that has to have come up um, in discussions uh, of procedural generation <laughs> before. Um, and one of my students, Yunus know, Rabi, has done a mathematical proof of why <laughs> the bowls of oatmeal problem exists. It's one of the best things I've ever seen. I can't wait to share it with people. And this is what I mean by like the next generation of, of researchers is they're just constantly coming up with things where I'm like, oh my God, this is this is fantastic. Um, so yeah, look look forward to that one later in the year. Um, uh, good. Yeah, I guess we, probably we should start Given unconscious here, time we'll start moving towards wrapping this bit up. Yeah, but yeah. Like, so, what what else have you actually got in the pipeline? Like, what actually is? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Well, at the moment, I'm working on something called January, so I'm building a little generative artwork every day of January. That's really fun, and I'm sort of it's made me think a lot about different generative projects in the future. Um, I'm working on a couple of games, which I'm keeping small and manageable. I'm going to hopefully release one of them later this year. And um, I'm wrapping up my my five year fellowship. Um, I've been funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering. It ends this November, so I'm doing all the last bits um, and uh, preparing for the next phase of the career, whatever that will be. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I've got going on. And of course, this podcast. Yes, um, you're part of this <laughs> wonderful collection. Yeah, um, exactly. I'm so grateful that you. When I said, "Hey, do you want to do this?" and you're like, "Yeah," because um, <laughs> we did this before. We did a podcast like many, we did many years ago. Um, we did it way back in time. Yeah. Ho hopefully, yeah. more people listen to this one. Hopefully, this one lasts longer too. Like, I mean, I was really proud of the stuff that we did on uh, Plus Four to Science, but it only lasted about eight nine episodes, if I remember right. Yeah, you've got fewer academics this time, so it's easier to get them all in a in a Zoom call at once. More um, co-hosts, also. Yeah. That was the that was yeah. that was my solution. Yeah. Was just if we just have more people in this. And just Definitely. treat it like the the wonderful hundred and one. Then Very we always that, have enough people on board because um, it's like a D and D session, right? It's like it's hard to get everyone in the in the room at the same time, right? Particularly yeah. when most of us, well, actually, most of us actually do live in the UK, but one of us lives in the US. Although that was a factor because I'm like everyone, 
I think so. Funnily enough, I think four of the five, we all live in the greater London area. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I haven't seen any of you in person. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's still difficult to coordinate. Um, but no, like that sounds, I'm, I'm excited for you in like the next, because already I think like getting to start in your position at King's last year was already like a kind of big transition for yourself because you moved from being a, like a, a researcher and particularly like a postdoctoral researcher and, and a researcher into like an actual lectureship as well, which yeah. from an academic perspective, if you're not familiar, that's kind of a big deal. Um, Permanent job. Yeah. Like as a, as a postdoctoral researcher, you're just kind of on the hustle moving into having your REE fellowship. Like that's a big deal as well because it's a, a decent amount of time. Yes. Attached to that a was a lot of change. security. Which, and and they've been yeah. amazing. Like I owe them so much, and and it's also the reason one of the reasons I got this job because it gives you the stability to actually find a permanent position. So yeah, Woo. right. <laughs> we'll take another quick break, and then we're going to start moving towards the wrap up. Right. We've got, we've got some questions from the audience this time for you. Oh, excellent. And we're back. Let's move hey. on. You're here. This is Branching Factor. This is episode three, but we're moving towards the end. Critically, though, before we do that, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that we wanted to cover with you. Um, Mike, we had a bunch of questions from the audience. I did reach out to our audience. Uh, for those of you, I was going to say for the first couple of episodes, if we haven't aired yet, we're actually recording this episode right before the first episode goes public. So if you're listening yeah. to us out in the wider world, Reach out at branchingfactor at aiengames.com if you want to send an email to us with questions. For all of our patrons who support us over on patreon.com forward slash aiengames, head into the Discord server. There is a dedicated area for you to ask questions. And so actually, it was the good people in our Discord server that sent us a bunch of questions. So, Fantastic. Mike, are you ready for some rapid fire? I'm super ready. All right. So first up from uh, Niels says, is there any developments in the field of PCG, Mike? or procedural content generation that Mike is excited about but hasn't pursued himself yet? Um, I've seen some really, like, waveform collapse, I guess, is one. Like, it's a really nice technique that's very minimal. It has great, like, you don't need much input. Um, but I've never actually dived into to the actual algorithm itself. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'd love to look at it in the future. It's in a few games. It's in Caves of Cud, uh, for example, if you've played that great roguelike. Um, yes. Indeed. Um, it's also uh, used in Townscaper, which... Ah, yes. about that yes, on right. uh, AI in games last year. Of course, year. yeah. Amazingly, my most successful video last year. Like, so many people watched that video. So surprised. Anyway, um, so Anne Sullivan. Never heard of her. Never heard of her. Um, <laughs> join us for the next episode. Anne's going to be the co host for the next episode. Um, first of all, the question was Does Mike understand what a badass he is? Which, Don't pass. Pass. <laughs> if Mike could change one thing about the field of AI research, what would it be? Oh, um, I would make it a lot easier to get funding to people who do not have computer science degrees to get them to to work with AI researchers. Um, that's that's the one thing I want to do, and I'm trying to do that. Um, I think we can change it, but but yeah, that's what I change right now. All right. So Betic asks: Are there any developments in academic AI that would make good fit make a good fit in games? that hasn't happened yet? It's a good question. Um, something I really love is uh, a lot of the stuff going on in uh, Matthew Gusdale's group, where um, over in Canada, um, Matthew's really talented at building these machine learning systems that respond to people. And it's designed, it's often done for like design tools, but what I'd love to see is, um, I'd love to us to go back to the days of black and white and creatures and actually put machine learning agents back in games and have me play with them. Not to be super intelligent, but to have them learn and, and be trained by me. I think that's what I want to put back in. Um, so yeah, check out Matthew's work if you want to see what that looks like. And then conversely, Betix also asked, are there any shortcuts or pragmatic bits in game dev that could be useful in an academic context? Oh, that's a cool question. Um... I think we should paper prototype more in uh, in academic research. I don't know. I don't know what you feel about that, I, but um, yeah. 
like Tommy and I sometimes go to a place called Darkstool, which I think um, has been covered on AI and games before indirectly, maybe or mentioned. Um, and uh, yeah, we've never actually done a video on it. We should we should maybe find a way to do that. At some that would point, be really but... cool. Yeah. Um, but but one of the great things that we do there is we get pens and paper and and bits of cardboard and stuff like that, and we paper prototype systems. And and I feel like that does need to you know it's a great way to make games quicker, you know, to test ideas out. And I feel like we should do that more for AI research. Yeah. And I think the last one that I got here was actually again from from Niels. What games or game, what game or games have procedural content generation techniques in them that you think have great untapped potential? Um, the untapped potential one is interesting. So something which um, came out recently that I was amazed at the subtlety of it is a game called Road Warden, which is a, a text based game. Um, and in dialogue with people, it will slip in these little procedural extra things that seamlessly change the dialogue into like a scene without you noticing. You don't even notice it's procedural. So someone will say something to you and then it will say like, the two of you walk over to the field of grass um, or like a child runs past playing with a ball. And at first you don't realize that they're procedural, but they actually are. And they, they give so much texture to the scene. Um, and I like that kind of small scale um procedural generation the stuff that's subtle that that feels like an artistic flourish um yeah, yeah. that's a very that's a very good answer i like that <laughs> just like little small things that are incidental to the game rather than like the big meaningful you know, story generation branching narratives or whatever just small yeah. little flourishes I think I like a bit of seasoning cool. on top you know hmm. pinch that was it was a really good garnish uh gif there that people can make um if you're watching the video version if you're listening to us on audio sorry you can just listen to that right now it sounded great so yeah um if you have questions for us on our next for our next future episodes either for mike or for the rest of the crew like i said reach out to us reaching out to us at branching factor at aiingames.com please don't sign us up to anything inappropriate um the spam filters can only do so much and of course you can reach out to us um on the discord server the Iron Games Discord server in our podcast corner. Um, and you can also just reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, I am AI in Games on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And Mike, you are MTRC. I am indeed. Indeed. With that, I'm also on uh, cohost.org slash MTRC. Oh, yes. See that as well. There's some cool stuff I put on there. Um, you're on Cohost. Yeah. You're on Mastodon, I believe, as well. I think so, somewhere on that. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's really difficult to share that. It's like, oh, I know AI yeah, Games is on Mastodon. It's like, where? I'm like, uh, <laughs> no idea. Somewhere. It's, it's, it's in there, though. You can have a look. You can have a look. Um, so, yeah, we're going to start bringing this episode to a close. Mike, thank you so much for joining us for episode Thanks so much, Tommy. three. This has been great. It's also just good to chat. It was. It's nice, it's nice just to have a bit of the bands, a bit of the bands, and you always have something interesting to say. So stick around for our next. So this is we're three quarters of the way through. Our fourth episode is going to be the last of our individual co-host episodes, and that's with Dr. Anne Sullivan, uh, a mutual friend of ours who does some absolutely wonderful work in a completely different area of games research as well, which is the thing I'm most excited about. Like you and I have a lot of alignment in sort of our research mm -hmm. interests. Not necessarily 100% overlap, but fairly close. Whereas Anne works in areas that are completely outside my remit. Yeah. And so it's one of the things I've always valued about hanging out with Anne is just I learn a lot from her, even if she probably doesn't think that herself. But I, I've certainly yeah. learned a lot just being in her presence and looking at the stuff that she's done. She brings in so many amazing other things into games research as well and, and AI research. Yeah, I'm super excited for that episode. It's going to be great. Yeah. And of course, like I said, we're, we're here. We're bringing this to you. Thanks to all our wonderful folks who are supporting Branching Factor on the AI and Games Patreon. And this is important because now, as a new part of our updated Patreon, you can go to patreon.com forward slash AI and Games. We give a shout out to all of our executive producers in the Patreon program. So, big shout out to Scup Ip Up. I still don't think I'm pronouncing that right, but Scup Ip Up <laughs> is how we're doing it. Brian Umalan, Bernard, Bernard Werner, and Michael Russell, they are our four executive producers for All Things AI and Games and get out a shout out at the end of every episode of Branching Factor. So if you want me to shout your name, or no, I can just say it really gently, like whatever, maybe a bit of ASMR, but you might have to pay a bit extra for that. Like I say, head on over to patreon.com forward slash AI and Games. With that, this has been Branching Factor. I've been Tommy Thompson. This has been Mike Cook. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next time. 
See you later. Bye. The Branching Factor podcast is hosted and produced by me, Tommy Thompson, with support from Anne Sullivan, George Osborne, Mike Cook, and Quang Yun. Our theme music is provided courtesy of Ben Ridge, and the logo and thumbnail art is thanks to Helen O'Dell. Special thanks to Shraddha Gumta and Phoebe Trigg for their additional production support, and of course, to all of you out there listening. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Branching Factor. Wherever you are in the world, be sure to stay safe, have fun, and we'll be back.